of the enemies. And we get ready to start talking about the judges now. So I, uh, I didn't even start reading this lesson. I already had, had been thinking about it. And I just uh, praise the Lord for the way He works. Once again, the lesson is just the introduction today to the judges. Now, the judges were basically governors who also acted as judges in both deciding controversy and executing judgment. I'm not even in the lesson yet. This is all just extra here. They were chosen and authorized by God to guide His people in the right direction. No judge ever came to power as a result of his own strength. Popularity. No, no judge ever came to power as his own strength or his own popu or popularity, although many leaders since then have. Many leaders in the Bible have. The judges were not so. They were all appointed by God. The judges were under the immediate direction of God and answered to Him for their decisions. This book reveals the inability of people to remain faithful without constant supervision apart from the Spirit of God working with us directly, working in us directly. It proclaims the needs, the need for laws of God and the faithful direction of our leaders to help us understand our need for the power of the Spirit to personally guide us and direct us in our daily walk. Without continual influence of the Spirit, we can see the same behaviors working in us as we saw continually working in the book of Judges. <clears throat> we tend to experience that same cycle, the same cycle that we see occurring in this book until we submit ourselves fully to God's will for our own lives through the power we receive from the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. It's also a reminder that it is not God's will that any should perish. And just as He gave the Israelites chance after chance after chance after chance after chance to turn to Him, He's done the same in our own lives. Chances are good we recognize that. We've experienced some of that mercy that He's shown us as we continued to fail Him before we came to know our under and understand our need for Him. He continues to show us mercy by, by allowing us to make poor decisions, and then we get to experience the results of those decisions. The results are designed to remind us of our inability to truly thrive in this life outside of God's perfect will. These results, the, these poor decisions that we make, guide us. They point us to a better way, a way of peace, and not tribulation, a way of hope and not despair, a way of everlasting joy and not the quickly passing pleasures of the flesh. So that is my introduction to the judges. <laughs> now I'll get into the text of the lesson here. Many people today overlook some of the most exciting parts of the Bible, the books of the Old Testament. In these books are found beautiful analogies, stirring prophecies yet unfolding, ethical lessons, and practical examples of great value to, to young and old alike. The time period of the judges of Israel is a prime example. There are so many things in the Word of God. I, I've, I've actually spoken to people, and, and they've said, no, I, I don't read the Old Testament. Well, why not? Well, we live in the grace dispensation, so there's, there's no need to look at that stuff. Well, if, if I recall correctly, the Bible itself tells us that all that was written aforetime was written for our learning. All that was written, not, not just some that was written, not just stuff since Jesus. All that stuff, everything after Jesus, that's the important stuff. But all that was written before, before time was written for our learning. There are so many things that we can glean from the Word of God if we'll simply take the time to look. Amen. There's so much benefit to receive. Uh, I know as I read through the Bible in my own private time, that's a lot of time where I get the inspiration for the, for the things that I write, for the things that I speak on. 
because as I read, God opens up more to me of His Word. And his, the Old Testament is full of powerful, inspiration-filling words, if we'll simply take the time to look. Looking at what God has done can reveal, looking at what God has done in the past can reveal what He will do in the future. And I feel like I might want to, I need to add here, and what He's doing at this very moment to lead us to a closer walk with Him. It's not just about what He's going to do in the future, but it's about what He's doing right now in our own lives. The Old Testament is full of spiritual food and facts relative to today's Christian. That's a, that's a wonderful statement there. It is. There are so many things that we see in the Old Testament that apply to us personally. If there was any question about that, all we have to do is go back and look at the last nine lessons that we just went through. Every one of them came from the Old Testament. And they point out different things, different aspects of our life, different trials that we may come across, different shortcomings we may have. And it's all a result of a reading of the Old Testament. It's all we have a better understanding of who we are today in God's sight by the words that we read in the last nine lessons. And we're moving forward in that. We've, we've, read, all, we've read about all of the enemies of the Israelites. We've seen all of those, those spirits that can, that can try to overcome us, that the enemy would try to put into our lives fear, intimidation, uh, the, the flesh, all these things that the enemy would try to influence us with to draw us away from the truth. Those things are found in the Old Testament to guide us today to a closer walk with the Son of God. It is also full of valuable instructions for the church. There are many types and shadows to be found in the lives and times of the judges of Israel. It is our hope that these lessons create in the student excitement to delve deeper into the Word of God. May the men, women, and events from the time of the judges come alive to us as never before, so that we are forever changed by the things discovered. I like this. It says, delve deeper into the Word of God. And as we had our little devotion here this morning, uh, I think word was spoken, uh, so it was that the Father, the Word, and the Spirit agree in one. The Word, that's the Son of God. Jesus is the Word made flesh. When we spend time in the Word, in the Bible, we're spending time with the Son of God. When, when we read, in the beginning, God said, let there be light. The Bible tells us that that word, that spoken word, was Jesus. The Word made flesh. He, he became flesh and dwelt among us. And the golden truth, Judges 2 and 10, and also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers, and there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which He had done for Israel. At part one, lesson exposition, the situation after Joshua, Judges 2, 7 and 8, and 10 through 13. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being an hundred and ten years old. And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers. And there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Baalim. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt, and followed other gods, of the gods of the people that were round about them, and bowed themselves unto them, and provoked the Lord to anger. And they forsook the Lord, and served Baal and Ashtaroth. Now that just a point out here, I don't know that everyone's familiar, but Baalim, that's, that's plural. It just means gods, false gods. Now, after the death of Joshua, there was no one appointed to step into his position as leader of Israel, as, he did, as he'd, had, he'd done when Moses died. The tribes had been allocated their areas of inheritance. However, there was still 
much to be done in order to fully possess the land of promise. Rather than taking the land as they had been commanded, they became content with the status quo. Now Judges 2 and 10 says, There arose another generation after them which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which He had done. Now, the lesson points out that there was no leader to take over after Joshua left. But it does not elaborate on his failure, the, the depth of his failure in this matter. Why was there a generation who did not know God or His works? From the first mention of Moses, there was very little time we read about when God was not actively working among His people until the days of Joshua. We see, in the, we see early in the leadership of Moses that he had Joshua by his side. Moses was a mentor and an example to Joshua from a very early age. Moses trained him with an understanding of his responsibility both to God and to the people. Joshua failed to recognize his need to do likewise, and it cost this new nation many years of turmoil. It was never God's will for his, this, his nation to have a king, but Joshua's failure was the first step in a long downward spiral of this nation that eventually led to the crucifixion of our Savior. If Joshua had been faithful to understand his need to train up someone to take up where he would leave off, much heartache and suffering could have been avoided. This too should serve as a warning to us and a reminder of our need to be those mentors, to be those examples that we need to be for these upcoming generations. <clears throat> Now, it wasn't too long ago, and I'm looking around here, and I'm pretty sure that uh, the largest majority of us here are familiar with the fact that not too long ago, the, the leadership of the church failed the people. They failed to raise up the next generation as they should have. As a result, many who were once faithful remain broken and unaware of their condition to this very day. Somewhere back in time, the importance of God's Word was not passed along to the next generation. That generation failed to see the danger of the path they were on, and sadly many fell into perdition. Praise the Lord, He provided a remnant. But if we are not careful, Amen. the same thing Amen. can happen again. We don't have a promise of a time. God doesn't say in His Word, okay, in 2022, you better be ready because that's time, ready or not. He just said He's coming. He's coming for a prepared people. If we are not the generation that is the prepared people, it's going to fall to our children and their children. If we're not ready, how is the next generation going to fare? If we're not preparing them as we should for what God has in store, how many more will have to fall away before we come to the place where God would have us to be? Right now, this very moment, we're standing at a fork in the road. The path that Moses took and the path that Joshua took stand before us. We owe it to God and the next generation to be faithful to lead and teach them from an early age the importance of absolute surrender to God. If not, we run the risk of losing what we've, what we've worked so hard to attain in our own submission to God's will. We risk the future of our children being sacrificed on the altar of worldly conformity. 
we cannot be content with the status quo. We've seen the results of this behavior firsthand and in God's Word. If we wish our children well, we will continue to press toward the mark and train the future generations of the church to do likewise. It's our only hope. It's their only hope. The generation of Joshua had seen firsthand the parting of the Red Sea, defeat of the Egyptian military, food from heaven, water from the rock, and many other miracles. However, their descendants did not know God in such a way. In disobedience, many began to worship other gods and intermarry with the enemy. Excuse me. Just as some today are beginning to allow the influences of the enemy to lead them away from the truth of God's love. Why did they not know Him or the works which He had done? Now, what are some, some of the possible answers to this question? Well, here's just a statement. Uh, we may have heard it before. That's something that just I cannot get out of my head. The ability of the people will never rise any higher than their leadership can't happen. If the leadership isn't faithful, the people will not be faithful. I've, I've had good pastors and I've had bad pastors as far as their leadership abilities. And it's amazing the growth that I was able to attain personally under those faithful ministers. And it's also amazing how far I slipped away from the truth when I was under those, those poor ministers who, who weren't prepared themselves Brother Chris, yes. the pastor used to have a, he got on that topic a lot, and he had a saying that we heard a lot, you can't hang a fence higher than a post. Praise the Lord. <laughs> That's a fact. <laughs> now this, this same thing applies to every aspect of our lives. If the leadership fails to strive to win that incorruptible crown, the people won't be interested in doing so either. Right. It is only by faithful leaders endeavoring to fulfill God's will that the people will begin to do the same. We are assured that we will have what we're hungry for. If we're hungry for mediocrity, we'll never meet God's will of perfection in our lives. The status quo is the bread and water of the mediocre. It may keep us from starvation, but that's about all it's going to do. But perfection is a feast that is set aside only for God's faithful servants, those who will recognize the importance of digging a little deeper. From this we see the importance of future generations maintaining a clear and enduring spiritual vision. As was said earlier, this can only be done by the leadership keeping their eyes fixed on firmly on God's Word and His will, and then passing those desires on to the next generation through their zeal for the truth. It's only when we get hungry that we'll receive what God has for us. Uh, something that I've all... I've, at least for so, quite some time now, I've had this thought in my mind that I just can't get rid of. And it's, we're going to do what we want. Whatever is important to us, that's going to get done. If we come to the end of the day, and I, I know I've said it before, if we come to the end of the day and we realize we hadn't spent a lot of time in God's Word, we hadn't spent enough time in our prayer closets, whatever it is that we have gotten done throughout that day, that's what was important to us. Because if God's Word was important to us, that would have been what we'd done first. We would have made sure that we got that accomplished. If spending time in prayer was important, that's what we would have done first. Because what's important, we're going to get accomplished. When I'm at work, there are things that come in, and there, there have been several times when uh, Courtney's come to me and she said, I, I need you to print me some tracts. Well, I'll gladly print you some tracts. But Sister Smith is getting ready to bring me the evening light here. 
And right now, the evening light takes priority. There's a schedule. It has to go out on the 20th. It's supposed to go out on the 20th of every month. If it doesn't, that affects everybody in the entire church. Everybody who receives evening light is affected. Same thing with Sunday school. Can't do it right now. I'm printing Sunday school. Now, this order for tracks is important. But if we're talking about 25 tracks that are going to one individual versus Sunday school with just the commentaries, we print 2,600, we have to put our priorities in order. Amen. Now, those tracks, I'm not saying that tracks, that the outreach ministry isn't important. But we have to have priorities. Those are some of the priorities that I have in, in my job. Those are things that I have to recognize. There, now, there are times when I'm able, okay, well, I, I just need to do this little job. I can, I can squeeze that in real quick. That's not, not a big deal. I can handle that. But most of the time, those priorities stand. And those are the things that I have to do first. Because it's my job to recognize the importance of these things. As Christians, as servants of the Lord, as ministers of the gospel, we have to recognize priorities. If our priorities are, are watching our favorite television show or hanging out with our, 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 our friends or, or going to eat uh, with somebody or, or whatever, then that's what we're going to do. If our priorities are serving the Lord, then we don't have to avoid those things. There's nothing sinful in, in hanging out with your friends. There's nothing sinful with, about watching some TV. <laughs> but it's where we put it on our list of priorities that makes it lean one way or the other. If we're substituting the time that we need to spend with God with anything else, anything else, then that's sinful. That's hindering our spiritual growth. That's, that's something that's standing in the way of the progress that God has set aside for our souls. It's something that's standing in the way not only of ourselves, but when we're looking at, looking at it from the perspective of this particular lesson, we're talking, about, we're talking about the souls of those we love. We're talking about if, if I don't spend the time that I need to in my prayer closet, if I don't spend the time I need to studying the Sunday school lesson, How's that going to affect you? Amen. If I don't spend the time serving the Lord that I need to, how's that going to affect those that I have to minister to? I will not be able to minister effectively anywhere if I've not submitted myself to God and recognized His priorities in my life. Back to the lesson real quick here. Physically, we use our eyes in virtually everything we do. Most depend on vision to steer them through their daily lives. Rather than being an actual part of the eye's anatomy, the pupil is merely an opening into the eye. Its black appearance is because the light that the pupil allows to enter the eye is absorbed and does not exit the eye. The anatomy of the eye allows humans to see in dim or bright light, but not in the absence of light. Without light entering the pupil, there is no sight. The eye is delicate, vision precious, and something to be defended. What about spiritually? Now, there's a whole lot of information here that we could uh, glean out of this little paragraph, these two little paragraphs that uh, the author of the lesson didn't drop in here. But I, just, I do want to add just a few words to it here. We must allow the light of God's Word to enter our hearts and then never to leave. It's like light enters the pupil of our eye and stays there. That's what causes our sight. That's what gives us our understanding of, of the things that are around us, our, the way we get through this life. And so it is with the Word of God. We have to allow the, wor the light of God's Word into our hearts so that we can understand how to navigate through this world, this fallen world that we live in. A wonderful aspect of God's light is that we can share it with others. And the fact of the matter is, the more we share, the more we have for ourselves. 
We, we don't lose the light of God in our own lives when we share it with others. As a matter of fact, it only increases the more we share with others. The light of God's Word in our lives is only diminished when we refuse to share it with others. That's the only way we can lose the light that we've received from God's Word. The focus of our vision will be reflected in the pupils of our eyes. One mother asked her son to look into the pu her pupils and tell her what he saw there. As he focused intently, he said, I see a little picture of myself. For anyone looking into our eyes, the focus of our vision should be obvious. The lesson says will be obvious. When the focus of our vision is God, He will be the one reflected in our eyes. When the focus of our vision is something else, that's what will be reflected there. What's the focus of your vision? Brother Chris, yes. that does the same for God when He says that we are the apple of His eye. Right. That literally means that our image is in His eye. Right. And uh, that's, to me, that was just such a, a wonderful revelation. Oh, absolutely. Just as this uh, mother and child, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the mother had the child in her eye as a small reflection. So God looks to us, looks on us, and we are the reflection. You know, to, uh, John says, he says, in him was life, and the life was the, the light, light of men. Him. Yes. You, you can tell most of the time now in, 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 in this world and in denomination, uh, most people have a knowledge of Christ, right? but they don't have Christ in them. Mm -hmm. Because if Christ was in them, that light would be shining out. It's, it's more Phariseeism than hypocrisy <laughs> than anything. Right. And, and it turns people away because people hear about Jesus and then you say you're a Christian so they expect you to lift up that standard. They right. expect you to walk by that rule. But then when you're supposed to have light, you don't have any light. Because right. you don't have Jesus. Right. Jesus is the light. We, I just... This Friday, I was just talking to someone and they were talking about their situation at work. And there are, she has two co-workers who claim to be Christians. And of course she is. But the problem is they have another co-worker who's absolutely positively not a Christian and has no desire for anything, anything that God would have for her. And sadly, it's a direct result of two of those who she works with. They claim to be Christians. They claim to be good moral people, but their actions betray the truth. They're not. But the fact of the matter is, this one who's not a Christian, the only thing that this person has experienced is in her life is that false Christianity that hypocrisy, that Phariseeism, that legalism, that holier-than-thou attitude that so many people have. That's the only thing she's experienced. So when she hears the word Christian, she immediately puts up a wall because that's all she recognizes. That's all she sees because that's all that she's had experience with. We can only know what we've seen. We can only experience what we've experienced. We can only have these examples that we've seen. There are so many times we, we look at the news and we talk about, we, they talk about how horrible these things have gone on with priests who have molested children and, and all these horrible things we read on the news uh, about televangelists and, and uh, the multi-million dollar uh, lifestyles that they live. When we look at the world, that's what they see as Christianity because that's the example that they have before them. That's all they've seen. Those who are, who are truly seeking God's will in their lives are so few. Jesus said, when the Son of Man returns, will He find faith on the earth? The, it also says, that as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of this coming of the Son of, Son of Man. Well, when I think about the days of Noah, what I think about is the fact that there were only eight people on the ark. There were very few who made it. 
we have to be that light. Because there are so many who the only example they've ever seen is what they see on TV. The only example they see is those examples like I had personally growing up in the mall. Those people yelling at me, telling me I was going to hell. That's the only thing they know about Christianity. Christian, Christians, all they do is yell at you, tell, they're going, tell you they're, that you're going to hell. Well, that's not a very encouraging thing. That doesn't make me want to go to church. I, I know I've said it before and I'll probably say it again. It makes me want to run away. I got enough problems in my life. I don't, I don't need to go hang out with a, at, a, at a place where everyone's going to hate me and talk bad about me and look at me funny because I don't fit in. That's not, that's not anything what I want in my life. That's not Christianity. Even though that's the example I had growing up, that's not Christianity. Christianity is to be like Christ. And since then, since my youth, I've read a little bit about the man. And I like what I see. I've experienced a little bit of what he's been able to do for me because of my willingness to submit to God. And I like what I see. That's what I want to be seen in my life. Now, I'm just one person. I'm not going to be able to, to change a whole lot of opinions about who Jesus is and who his people are. But who I can reach... I want to be able to. I want to be able to make a difference. I want to be able to, just like the one I was talking to, she's doing her best to make a difference because the one she's dealing with who isn't a Christian, she can be that example. She's doing her best to be that example and help this person understand just because you wear a shirt that has a cross on it, just because you got cross earrings, a cross necklace, a cross ring, just because you have a bumper sticker that's in the shape of a fish. These things do not mean you are a servant of God. Amen. That simply means that these people are conforming to what they've seen. I heard a, heard a commercial on the radio uh, not too long ago. I think I've gotten way off the topic, but I feel like it, that's the direction I need to go right now. So uh, the lady was getting, getting in a car with her friend and getting ready to go somewhere. And she was talking, oh, I noticed you have a, a Jesus fish on the back of your car. And she said, oh, yeah, it's, it's wonderful. I thought, you know, we, we wanted a bumper sticker. We wanted something, but we wanted to really expand on who we were and, and what we believe. So we decided we'd get us a Jesus fish. Oh, get out of my way! I'm sorry. Uh, I, what was I saying? Oh, it was talking about the Jesus fish. That's right. Yeah, it's, it's been such a blessing to have this, to, just to explain to the whole world that I follow Christ. Oh, hey, what do you think you're doing? I'm driving here. I'm sorry. It's such a blessing to be this witness. Everywhere I go, I can have this Jesus fish on the back of my car. Um, I don't know, but her behavior... Kind of, kind of explains that that Jesus fish on the back of her card doesn't really indicate who she is. Yes. Yes. Uh, that's, that's where the Church of God, I think a lot of our uh, trials and tests and persecutions, we have to be a tried people and because we have a lot of responsibility because that world that Christ died for is going to be looking for the goods. Mm -hmm. and, and we're going to have to buckle down and let God do what he needs to do in our lives mm -hmm. to where when the pressure comes, when the persecution comes, when those people really need to see people of God, mm -hmm. we'll have the goods. Right. We've got to stand the test and we've got to do the trials and make God pleased in us. Amen. Amen. Now there's a saying... You know, into this last paragraph, what's focus of your vision? There's a saying that I know we have all heard. You are what you eat. Well, while in the natural, this truth, the truth of this saying isn't quite absolutely accurate because last time I checked, I'm not a chicken. <laughs> I'm a man. I'm a person. In the spiritual, this fact is just a little bit more absolute. Whatever we allow into our lives will be reflected by our behavior. If God is truly our focus, 
then His will in our lives is the visible outcome of our actions. If we consume the attitudes and the attributes of this world, it will also be clearly seen in the choices and the mannerisms that we have. Each of us is responsible for our own choices. If we seek to honor God and His church, our behavior will automatically lead others to Christ. If we seek to please ourselves, we're only ever going to drive people away from God's will. It's the only outcome that there will be. Consequences of Disobedience, Part 2. And an angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I made you to go up out of Egypt and brought you unto the land which I swear unto your fathers and said, I will never break my covenant with you. And you shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. You shall throw down their altars. Excuse me. But ye have not obeyed my voice. Why have ye done this? Wherefore I also said, I will not drive them out before, from before you. But they shall be as thorns in your sides, and their God shall be a snare unto you. And the anger of, anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he said, Because that this people hath transgressed my covenant, which I commanded their fathers, and have not hearkened unto my voice, I also will not henceforth drive out any from before them of the nations which Joshua left when he died, that through them I may prove Israel whether they will keep the way of the Lord to walk therein as their fathers did keep it or not. Therefore the Lord left those nations without driving them out hastily. Neither delivered He them into the hand of Joshua. It's Judges 2, 1 through 3 and 20 through 23. The passing of the Joshua generation ushered in an era of faithless people who did not know God. For the most part, it seems that they were not concerned with even keeping His commandments. Their sinful disobedience brought the harsh and long-lasting consequences of which God had warned them when He commanded that they form no leagues or treaties with the inhabitants of the land. In their rebellion, Israel became ensnared in the evil all around them. This is a picture of a nation who has rejected God. What are, their, what are the similarities between Israel's rejection of God and the current state of our own nation and the world. Now, to me, I just thinking about this question just as the children of Israel, the society in which we find ourselves is a reflection of the attitudes of its people. Many blame the government or try to point the finger elsewhere, but the failure is 100% our own. Case in point, in this very city, it was well within my lifetime that liquor by the drink was unheard of in this town. The faithfulness of all the churches working together made that fact a continuing reality. But there came a time when a restaurant, which is known for selling liquor by the drink, petitioned to open a franchise here. Now the churches came together and it didn't happen at that point. But over the years, others also petitioned to open the, doors in, open the doors of this town. And eventually, liquor by the drink was accepted. Now, many years later, those are the very restaurants which are kept in business by guess what? The after church Sunday crowd. Those are the ones keeping these businesses afloat. Those same congregations that fought so hard to keep liquor by the drink out of town now keep these places in business by their patronage. And if you mention this fact to most of them, they will defend their actions by saying, oh, we don't buy liquor there, we just buy food. By their actions, the same group of people who once stood firm against this activity now defend those whom they once opposed. While if churchgoers in unity would refuse to eat in these establishments, they would quickly go out of business in this town. They would absolutely leave. 
We can blame whoever we like, but our choices remain our own. Those choices represent our attitudes and affiliations. They reflect our character and our alliances. 2 Corinthians 6, 14-18 Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you. And ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. We are known by the company we keep. Part 3, Vicious Cycle, Judges 2 and 19, And it came to pass when the judge was dead, that they returned and corrupted themselves more than their fathers in following other gods to serve them and to bow down unto them. They cease not from their own doings nor from their stubborn way. In the absence of an earthly leader, Rather than looking to God for guidance and direction as they should have, Israel as a whole turned their backs on Him. Isn't this a perfect example of the religious world today? There is no good religious leader in the world system of religion, Christianity today. And as a result, all those who, I say all those, so many of those who call themselves Christians actually bear very little resemblance to Christ in, the, in their actions and in their behaviors every day. As the example I gave with a woman with a fish on the back of her car, that tends to be the, the biggest example that we see of those who call themselves Christians today. Whether it's in, in private or in public, if it's uh, the, uh, the large televangelists or the or the preacher down the street. That seems to be the example that's most abundant in the world today when it comes to those who call themselves Christians. In so doing, they fell prey to opposing social, political, and religious influences. As they wandered away and were led astray, God allowed the protective hedge about them to erode away. Once the hedge of protection was removed, Israel became virtually powerless. Consider some of the ways which this can relate to us today. Now, this is before I even read the lesson, but Nick and I were talking about uh, at last church last week after church about the book of Judges, and God gave me a pretty powerful analogy concerning this very topic. Salvation, salvation is absolutely a blessing from God. It is the greatest expression of mercy and grace to a fallen world who only deserve destruction as a result of their own choices and actions because of the power of sin over our lives. But this blessing is not the completion of God's love, but only the beginning. It's only the start. By it we have hope of eternal joy in the Lord. Yet this hold seems tenuous. Salvation experience is wonderful, but it's a little flawed in its incompleteness. The Bible is clear in many places in the New Testament that the loss of salvation is possible. But I'm including a single verse here for brevity and conscience sake. 2 Timothy 4 and 4, And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. We cannot turn away from the truth if we did not first believe it. <clears throat> without constant attention, that sinful nature will draw us away from God's mercy and back towards self-will. Often it happens so slowly that we don't even notice. We don't even recognize that we're slipping in the wrong direction. <clears throat> but then, 
we awake to the reality of the outcome of our decisions and cry out to God for deliverance again. Matthew 14, 29, 30, And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Now, if this isn't an example, uh, an analogy of faith, true faith in God, I don't know what is. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. Peter was walking by faith, but when doubt filled his mind, he began to sink and cried out to Jesus to rescue him again. All that has been included included in the Bible is for our learning. The book of Judges is a reminder to those of us who live in the grace dispensation that sanctification is the power of God to overcome that sinful Adamic nature and its tendencies. Chances are good we've all been there. We've all been saved and slowly allowed the things of this world to draw us away only to cry out to God again. And God had mercy on us. He continues to have mercy on us to this very day. He continues to show us, allow us to see His grace in our lives as we wake up and start every new day. <clears throat> yes? Everybody that was that Moses delivered out of Egypt, God delivered out of Egypt. With, they they died. Everybody that was over twenty years old. Yep. They died, and this generation was raised in the in the wilderness. Mm-hmm. And, uh, they had seen the miracles of the Lord, mm-hmm. and they were the ones that you know accessed the the promised land. Right. But they soon forgot. Mm-hmm. And so that generation, even though they were raised in the wilderness with the miracles of the Lord, when they got into their land and got comfortable, mm-hmm. they, they turned away from God. Well, the Bible says Jeshurun waxed fat and kicked. Yeah. <laughs> they got happy, they got wealthy, and they decided they didn't need God anymore. They do things on their own. Israel's enemies having heard the mighty things done by Jehovah, surely recognized the rebellious state of the Israelites and used it to their own advantage. Soon Israel was caught up in a vicious cycle of rebellion, oppression, and and repentance, followed by deliverance and peace, as they would cry out to the Lord with their sincere repentance. God would invariably raise up a deliverer. However, when each judge would die, the children of Israel would return to their wicked ways, the next generation swiftly becoming more evil than the previous one. Part 4, Judges 2, 16 and 18. Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges which delivered them out of of the hand of those that spoiled them. And when the Lord raised up judges, then the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For it repented the Lord because of their groanings by reason of them that oppressed them and vexed them. I'm running quickly out of time, so I just have a few more notes I want to make sure I get in here. In the book of Judges, we see that each and every one of the deliverers, each and every one of these judges, they were human and had normal human existence. Their lives eventually were overcome by the hands of time, just as our lives are today. While it is not uncommon for us to exhibit the same cycle as the Israelites in our own lives, that cycle is not a necessity. Our deliverance was also overcome by our our deliverer was also overcome by death. But death's, over, death's victory over Jesus was very short-lived. Romans eight thirty three and 34, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who, ev- who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. As a result of Jesus' victory over death, We need not uh, to experience those recurring failures. Our deliverer has no end. So by our continual reliance on Him, we can overcome that cycle and remain faithful to the end. In the middle of the paragraph part, 
first paragraph, part five, it says, uh, looking, in, looking at it from a distance, we have no trouble identifying their mistakes. But then again, we have never had trouble pointing out flaws in others Amen. while ignoring our own. Amen. When the Israelites were asked to give for the construction of the tabernacle, they gave so much that they had to be restrained. Now, let me ask you this. When was the last time in any church service, pastor or somebody stood up and said, Stop, wait, wait. You're giving way too much money. You're going to have to quit. Have you ever heard that? Okay, then we haven't attained to the level of the Israelites because that's where they found themselves. So yeah, they failed. But so have we. Uh, read some of the conclusion real quick. About 35 seconds worth. As we study the upcoming lessons on the individual judges, let us seek to apply these thi the things we learn, using them in witnessing, telling others with such enthusiasm that they too will want to come and hear and find out for themselves. Let us challenge one another to an inspired Sunday school. Amen. I praise the Lord for the opportunity. Yes. Praise something was said here that was a, a blessing to somebody. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>